All right, hello Dragon Con, all of you who are in here. Uh, this is Hacking 101 Coronavirus Edition. I'm your moderator, Dustin Smith. We're going to start with some introductory op questions for our panelists so that you can get to know them. We have Xavier Ash, Ray Kelly, Rebecca Carlson, Keith Watson, and Kurt, Kurt Opsal. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and start with Xavier? You want to do an introduction of yourself real quick? Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Xavier Ash. I am uh, on the blue team side of things. I've been uh, done a little bit of everything in my career. I'm uh, getting close to my 30-year mark. Uh, been been around the Atlanta area for quite a while. Uh, currently uh, in in the finance area, uh, so doing uh, running in, in a couple of teams in the security operations uh, side of things. So. Um, so yeah, I can uh, talk a lot about uh, you know working uh, on on uh, you know in the blue team and um, uh, you know uh, consulting, uh, engineering, uh, architecture, things like that. So, all right. Okay, um, Ray, you're next. Hey, I'm Ray Kelly, and I'm a principal security engineer uh, with White Hat Security, and most of my background is around development. So, uh, and also application security. So application security is my focus, whether it be DAST, SAST, or mobile uh, type of assessment. So that's kind of where my background is. That's it. Okay, Rebecca? Uh, so I'm also on the blue team side of the house. Um, I do uh, incident response, and uh, I also kind of borderline do like third level SOC uh, type work. Um, I've done um, incident response for about five years now. And before that, I was in vulnerability management. So I kind of bounce around to different areas of information security. OK. Uh, Keith. Hi, all. Um, I'm Keith, uh, otherwise known as X-Ray, if you come to DC 404 meetings. I've been at Georgia Tech for over 30 years. I'm the Information Security Manager at College of Computing, uh, GX Certified Security Incident Handler. Um, in a past life, I was a Navy electronics technician on submarines. I specialized in cryptography and signals intelligence. I'm the sponsor of Gray Hat and Mad Hatters, which is the College of Computing student organization for hacking and information security. I'm the host of the local DEF CON chapter here in Atlanta, DC 404. Uh, I moderate the channel, IRC channels for both DC 444 and Gray Hat. I'm also one of the moderators on the Atlanta Cybersecurity Engineers Discord server, and I'm a member of the Atlanta 2600 group, um, also a member of Electronic Frontiers Georgia, and work with Scott all the time uh, trying to advise the local politicians on technology issues. Um, I'm also co-developer of Network King of the Hill uh, CTF. And for anybody who's interested, we host monthly CTFs at DC 404 and 2600 meetings. Next. All right, last but not least, Kurt. Hey, buddy, uh, my name is Kurt Opsel. I am the Deputy Executive Council Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit uh, foundation dedicated to defending your rights online. Uh, one of the things I do at EFL is I work on our workers' rights project where we free legal counsel to security researchers who have questions about the quality of research or issues that might arise uh, when we're disclosing uh, vulnerabilities to a vendor to the public. So I guess unlike everyone else panel, I'm coming from the, uh, the legal side, not the technical side. It's a pleasure to be back again at uh, Hack01, and I look forward to uh, folks' uh, uh, great discussion. Okay. Uh, now we're going to start with some questions for you guys. Uh, so first question I'm going to ask is, what is hacking to you? And we'll we'll start in the same order that you guys introduced yourselves in. So go ahead and start, Xavier. Sure. Uh, so hacking to me, I think, is um, uh, is a mindset. It's it's basically the idea that uh, you you uh, want to. Uh, generally, not only know 
how something uh, works inside, but also, uh, you know, how can you possibly make that thing do something it wasn't supposed to do? Uh, so adding uh, adding new features, uh, finding out, uh, you know, in particular ways it breaks. Uh, but the the, uh, the, the, the just when somebody calls themselves a hacker, it really, uh, to me, is, 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 is more of a, a mindset on, on really how you like to learn. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, right. Yeah, I'm going to second Xavier. Um, the idea of breaking things is just fun to me. Um, and, uh, you know, hacking is a lot of that, right? If, if you have a web form on a website that says, you know, type in your age, and instead of a number, you type in a letter, that's just fun. <laughs> and to see what the application does. Can I break it? Um, and if you break it, sometimes that can lead to serious vulnerabilities. So um, I think going along those same lines, that the idea of um, using applications in unintended means or unintended ways um, is a way to find security vulnerabilities. And so that's kind of uh, the way I look at it. Okay, and Rebecca? Um, definitely the, the same as uh, Xavier and, and Ray in terms of making something work uh, in a way it was not designed for. Um, and I, I think it covers everything from like old school overclocking CPUs to uh, even social engineering um, where you're, you're basically hacking humans. You're trying to pretend you're somebody else to have them do a specific reaction or take a specific task. Um, so I, I think it's a pretty broad category. I think it's not necessarily the, the person living in their mother's basement who's head down only focused on, on a screen in front of them. I think there's a lot of different ways you can identify yourself as a hacker. I just heard a cat. Okay, uh, Keith. Okay, uh, whoops. Okay, I just posted some stuff there for some people. Uh, I get asked this a lot at, at DC44. We have people show up all the time asking, I want, I want to hack. What's, what's hacking? So I wrote a web page called How to Get Started Hacking. And hacking in its simplest definition is the process mm -hmm. by which you discover the difference between what something was designed to do and what it's capable of. It applies to any subject. You could hack golf golfing, you can hack computers, you can hack music. It's about the continual learning and exploring, improvising, overcoming and adapting, not being defined by failure. Uh, you're like water, you just find a path. A two-year-old never notices all the time he fails when learning to walk, doesn't pay attention to him. So one of the things you have to do is learn to manage failure and disappointment <laughs> when things don't go the way, the way you want. Um, it doesn't matter really where you where you start, just pick something of interest and start digging. Everything is connected and interdependent, so you'll eventually get to where to everything else. It's going to take time, so learn to enjoy the process. And one of the things I stress with all our students is ethics. Hacking is a mindset and requires skill. The skills can be used for good or evil. You're going to have to decide how you're going to use your skills. Now, using your skills for evil will unravel the fabric of trust that our very society is based on. And without that trust, people stop making the cool things that we get to explore. So it's very important to maintain that. So you're going to have to choose whether you're going to be the person who just repairs and builds that fabric of trust or destroys it. That's hacking. Well put. All right, Kurt. Well, that was a that has been a great set of, of definitions so far. Uh, uh, I think I, I uh, broadly with the, with the panel, uh, I, I would say for myself that that a lot, a lot about what hacking is is seeing the world for what is possible and not just what is uh, presented to you. That uh, you know, seeing a a lock as a puzzle, not a barrier. Uh, when when something is is provided, it says it can only only be used for this, figure out if it can also be used for that. Uh, and it requires a lot of uh, thinking outside of the, the, the paradigms. Uh, and this, you know, finds abilities as well. Like that is very intrinsic to the hacking process 
is what if you throw out the assumptions of how somebody will use it? Some mentioned earlier, you know, uh, if you ask for a number, but uh, if you uh, look at look at the available options, and a lot of things work just fine so long as everybody uses them exactly as the original designer imagined. But the truth is that people will not, whether they're they're hacking to explore, or hacking to uh, uh, do bad, uh, or even just you know misunderstanding ending the UI coming out a different way uh, and so uh, one of the great abilities of hacking is discovering those things both for security vulnerabilities so that you can uh, uh, find them figure out and repair them or, or improve the knowledge for the the next set of people who are designing uh, or, or in order to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, beat systems and get to do important uh, information uh, so it's it's a wonderful mindset of, of exploring and a wonderful mindset of not being just accepting that someone says you can only use this for such and such or and you find out that in fact it is an awesome tool you know it goes back to like the captain crunch whistle which was designed just to be a toy and it makes a note but it turned out that it was an incredible tool for making phone calls like outside the bar uh, another you know uh, some great hacks are very simple there was uh uh, back in the night when, when CD music was a thing, people had this whole uh, digital rights management uh, CD, and it was amazing, very difficult to crack, except that if you just took a black magic marker, put it physically on the CD and blocked off crack, then it was entirely gone, was defeated by a magic marker. And that's like thinking out the box. It's also the kind of people like in you know, the hacking mentality, you look both ways before crossing a one-way street because you're not going to assume everything is going to go as it is. So I, I think uh, I love hacker mindset. I think also what uh, X-Ray just said about, uh, you know, uh, do it for good, not not for evil. I think there's a lot of great power comes uh, great responsibility to, to draw from uh, Spider-Man. Uh, and if you have these, these powers, uh, try to use it to make the world a better place. Okay. All right. Well, the next uh, question is going to be a uh, little switch up of what, from what we've done in the past years. Uh, what is your favorite hack that you've done or hack that you have heard of? So, Xavier. Um, favorite hack I've heard um, or, or, or done. You know, um, I... I think that um, I don't know. I'm kind of stumped. Anybody else can jump in? I'm sure, sure I'll think of something. Go ahead, free for all. Whoever wants to answer. I can think of one. Uh, I have to be careful how I share it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were on an operation, and a critical piece of equipment failed. Um, the display failed. And we didn't have a spare on board. And so I was watching the guy who was working on it, trying to figure out what was going on. And I realized that two, it was a 19 inch rack of equipment and two, about eight U's or 10 U's down below it was an oscilloscope. And so I'm looking at the schematics and I said, Hey, uh, where do you, where are the, where's the scan horizontal scan generator? And where's the vertical scan generator outputs? So he showed me where they are. And I says, can we wire coax into those locations? So we literally pulled the CRT out of the device and wired coax into the front panel to the X and Y drive and to the Z drive, which is your intensity, brought them out and put them into the X and Y, the O-scope, and the intensity of the O-scope, and then set the O-scope up. And now the oscilloscope was now substituting for the CRT that had been in its place. Um, now we pulled the signals from before the high voltage section. And then we duct taped over the hole where the, CR, the display had been. And as a result, we didn't fail the mission. It would have been a, a fail, go back home uh, failure. So the fun part was when we, on the way back in, we have to announce uh, radio in when we surface, this is on a submarine, have to radio in and tell them uh, if we have any critical casualties on board that need to be fixed. Uh, casualties not being dead people, but being broken stuff. And... Uh, we said, yeah, we have this this critical piece of equipment is down. Uh, there was another one that we did some cool stuff to, but I can't talk about that one. <laughs> the, uh, so we we radioed that ahead. So when we pulled up the pier and tied up, 
a guy from uh, the mobile technical unit was there at the pier ready with a toolkit to come down and fix this thing. So when he came down, he walked up to us and said, hey, we hear this thing is broken. And we kind of looked at him and looked at each other and said, well, sort of. And he says, well, is it functional or not? Well, sort of. So he goes in and he looks and sees what we have done to get this thing up and running. And he is absolutely flabbergasted. He cannot believe that we actually hacked this thing to use an O-scope for the display of this thing and keep us from failing a critical mission. So that was one of the, the ones I really remember. That was fun. So uh, it, um, one of the uh, a very interesting hack that I, I uh, just just learned about, uh, it, and it's a uh, more of a discovery of a hack. Uh, so a couple of folks on Twitter had just uh, posted this, and and uh, 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 Foon, I think if if, if it's uh, pronounced right, uh, basically did a full breakdown. The hack is uh, um, we the um, uh, for pregnancy tests. All right, so pregnancy test, you, 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 uh, you know, they have the strip, the chemical strip, and based off of the, you know, the, the chemical compound in your urine, uh, you will either get one uh, line for not pregnant or two lines for pregnant. And, and so uh, then you can pay, I think it's like a couple dollars for those pregnancy tests. Then you can go uh, up to like, you know, I think it's like eight or nine bucks to get a digital one. And uh, so somebody, you know, just, just you know, of technical mind, popped that thing at sucker open and figured out the digital one is basically the same chemical strip, and then it has two digital readers on, or, or basically little little uh, little eyes there, and it is digitally reading the line. Uh, so uh, basically, you are getting the exact same. Uh, uh, chemical detector in a digital uh, uh, um, uh, uh, pregnancy test uh, versus an analog one. Uh, and of course, you know, the technical people are always like, look at this, it's a scam, you're spending eight dollars for you know something that probably costs you know 80 to 80 cents uh, and uh, any anybody can read you know one line versus two. Uh, Overnight, people kind of uh, uh, continue to, to talk, and, and what, what was interesting to find is that actually humans can't read lines just as well as computers, and uh, that the uh, accuracy rate of those of those chemical uh, strips is like ninety nine percent. However, you give it to humans and you tell them to read one line versus two, and the uh, the, uh, the the reality is only seventy five percent of people get that right. So the uh, uh, the digital readers, even though you know we pay a couple extra dollars uh, for those, ends up being uh, a, a a big plus uh, to making sure that people understand <laughs> how those work. I just thought it was just just marvelously, you know, uh, that that uh, Foon, if, if F O O N E, I think is how it, uh, is on, on. He does a lot of breakdowns, uh, but this was one of the most fun ones, and I think he's he's gone on to hack it and uh, was able to like get a little video to run on the screen, uh, and he's continued to go on and do amazing things. But just just the reality of how those uh, little digital uh, pregnancy tests uh, uh, work was 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 pretty interesting to me. Yeah, we were just talking about that today on the DC four hundred four sub channel on the cybersecurity discord and i just posted the twitter post because you reminded me of it <laughs> so in fact you probably were part of that conversation so all right and uh rebecca do you have anything um just to reiterate uh the example that kirk gave i definitely remember taking the magic marker and doing my my cds uh, but it reminds me of one that was kind of later in the 2000s uh, after Keurigs were developed. And this was like a complete hack for non-technical people. Uh, when they went to, I think it was their 2.0 design, they decided to barcode all of the official K-cups. And they would only work, so they would, only official cups that are licensed by Keurig could actually work in the machine. Um, and what people did was they would take the little barcode and cut it off and just permanently stick it up on the sensor so it always read it 
so you could do your own, make your own pod or some sketchy thing that I don't know people get in the back alleys of Starbucks. I have no idea. Um, but I thought that was absolutely hilarious and a good way of getting around uh, DRM. All right. And I can uh, uh, throw one oh. out for you if you like. Um, so, and I can disclose this pub. This was released publicly, so I can I can speak to this. <laughs> like Xavier was having issues. <laughs> First of all, all of us have to think about what we can speak about. So, this is one of the challenges for all the panelists here. Um, but uh, I worked for a small company, uh, a startup around application security, and we were acquired by a very large company. And uh, once I got there, I was able to see the salary and stock options of all three hundred thousand employees. Uh, once I got there and the way I found it was that um, they had their own homegrown uh, HR system which no longer exists also so it's safe there too um, and w I was a manager of people so I had people reporting to me and we had in their portal where I could go and give raises or look at salaries or give stock options and such just like any normal HR system and I thought you know what I wonder how uh, how tight this thing really is and so go over and ask a buddy of mine who worked for the same company, hey man, what's your employee ID? He gave it to me, no problem. <laughs> uh, it's not a, that wasn't a big secret because they're on everyone's ID badges. And so what I did is I intercepted the request to the HR system and just swapped out the employee ID that I was looking for with my buddy's ID who did not report to me. And sure enough, it gave me back all of his salary information, all of his stock options, his work history with the company. And so with that now, I was able to look up anybody I wanted in the entire company. And not only that, that wasn't actually the cool part. The cool part was, okay, well, that's my buddy. How do I figure out what the big guys make, right? How do we get into the executive team? And uh, so I was thinking about, you know, how do I find those guys' employees' IDs? And so there was a portal there. Like a lot of big companies will have maybe a SharePoint or some system that they can all get onto and and. Uh, submit documents or have their own web pages for their different business units and just out of a hunch I took my employee ID and type and put it in the search and hit go and an Excel spreadsheet came back that had been indexed with every single employee's name and employee ID in it so now I had the keys of the kingdom <laughs> for anybody that I wanted to look up and so that was kind of interesting where there was quite a few failures uh, in this whole uh, the whole setup there did it expose social security numbers and everything as well? You know, I don't recall that if it did or not. I imagine it probably did since it was all the employee information. Okay. You got anything, Kurt? Sure, sure. Obviously, so uh, you know, not not as a, as a hacker myself, but you know, we've advised many uh, hackers over the years, uh, uh, and so I thought I would at least uh, highlight one that. Uh, uh, we made a lot of press at the time and, and uh, hit some interesting issues, and that was uh, Barnaby Jack, uh, about uh, 10 years ago at Black Hat, uh, released uh, uh, some, some demonstrated some vulnerabilities with ATM machines. Uh, jack spotting, I think. Anyway. And uh, uh, this was at a time when uh, there were a lot of uh, these ATM machines, you'd see them in like convenience stores or in bars. Uh, they, you know, not, not banking ATM machines, but sort of private party ones that uh, uh, were pretty commonplace, and they had some rather uh, terrible uh, uh, security flaws, you know, default passwords. Uh, they, uh, it was kind of a bad uh, ecosystem, uh, and he put together uh, a, a program that did it, an ex you know, proof of concept of, of his exploit. I think it was named Dillinger uh, after the great uh, uh, bank robber from the twenties. Uh, uh, but uh, what was uh, you know particularly about it was uh, on stage and had an ATM machine that that uh, 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 you know uh, flashed some lights, uh, spewing uh, money onto the, onto the stage, uh, which you know is of course unnecessary. You would never actually do that if you want to rip off an ATM machine. You would want to be as quiet as possible. But the, the real point was to draw attention to the, the security vulnerabilities in that ecosystem and to create something that uh, would make some news and make the people who were doing it uh, pay attention. Uh, he did the uh, uh, demonstrated the flaws against uh, two manufacturers who 
you know, uh, responded actually reasonably well to that and fixed up, uh, patched the, the ATMs. But uh, uh, the, the industry as a whole was filled with these flaws. And so by, by doing, a, a, you know, a, a, as seen in movies kind of hack and in real life live on, on stage, brought the uh, got people to take it a lot more seriously in the, uh, in the ATM industry. And I think brought a lot of good to it. Plus, it was really fun to watch. Anybody else have anything they would like to add or talk about on the on the same subject, or is everybody done with this one? I, I, I did have think of another one. Was uh, a little old school. Was was flippies? Anybody remember what what a flippy is? So they got the floppy drive, the eight and a half, uh, or five an inch, uh, five and a quarter inch drives. Um, basically, uh, you could uh, you know you take a uh, a, a hole a hole puncher and punch the side of it to be able to then flip it over and use the other side uh, as, as a drive. Uh, you would you basically buy the discs that would say, you know, single-sided. Uh, then you would take a hole punch and punch a little hole and make another little dent in the side, and then you could flip it over and use the other side. Uh, basically doubled your, your storage capacity for free. Uh, there was a, 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 an equivalent hack for the three-and-a-half-inch uh, three discs, uh, but you had to drill a hole in the in the specific place. So uh, we had, uh, we had I remember hacking that, you know, hacking those flippies to get, you know, because every 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 uh, every floppy was was you know very critical storage back then. But okay, all right. So and uh, another question: uh, How would you suggest that people get started with hacking who have no experience with it whatsoever? Uh, uh, whoever wants to answer, I'll let you answer at your own time. I would suggest um, meeting up with your local uh, DC group, like DC 404, DC 770. I've heard rumor of a DC 678, but I don't think I've ever seen where it sells. Yeah, um, there is one. Oh, there is? Okay. Mm -hmm. I've, I, I keep hearing about it, but I have no idea where it's actually where it actually takes place. Um, I think that would be a good start because you can start to, you can listen to what other people do um, and get an idea of, of what's out there and what the, the possibilities are. Okay. okay. Um, anybody else want to go? Yeah, that, that's a great suggestion. Uh, you know, getting, getting uh, um, you know, to find your local teams is, is definitely there. Um, so I, uh, you know, there are several good entry points for uh, switching into the security world. And uh, um, and so, you know, I'd like to point out a couple of them. Uh, the, the most obvious one that a lot of people, you know, uh, seek to is, is starting off as a, as a SOC analyst or a security operations center analyst. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, the the uh, SOC analyst is, is, is a great place to start because uh, there is there is uh, kind of a higher turnover there, so there's there tends to be some good opportunity, um, and, um, and and there's a lot of learning uh, on on the job uh, because a lot of the things that a SOC analyst does is is fairly repetitive and 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 uh, you know you're, you're responding to alerts, you have a certain way that you're supposed to respond, uh, but the the teams have a, a great tiered architecture that allows you to, uh, you know, come in as a fairly junior person and, and, and learn a whole lot. Um, I, I am currently running a couple of uh, a tools teams, and so I've got a couple of, of you know, fairly, uh, you know, first time to security folks. These are uh, technical people, uh, however, just have not been a part of security. So uh, we run, uh, you know, run all the security tools. And so, you know, to do that, uh, you really just need to know how computers work. So I've got people that have been in other parts of IT uh, and and are switching into the uh, security world. Um, there's a, lot of, I mean, a couple of other entry points that, that a lot of people look at, uh, you know, governance and auditing. Uh, there's there's a lot of different uh, places to go. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you mostly hear about uh, the, the, the becoming a SOC analyst. Now, everybody wants to be a red teamer. Um, and uh, uh, I, I say there's generally fewer or fewer jobs there, but I can I'll let other people on the on the board that might know a little bit more about how to get started as a red teamer. Okay. 
Um, and uh, Ray, do you have anything? Uh, yeah. So again, uh, like I said, the intro is uh, kind of where I focus on is application security. And the nice thing about this is you guys, uh, anyone watching can get started right after this call and start playing with things. Um, a good resource is OWASP.org, um, and I'll paste that into the chat here. Um, so that's pretty much everything uh, related to application security. There's a lot of resources where um, there's purposely vulnerable applications that you can practice on in lessons that show you what to do, what to look for. Um, if you want to try SQL injection, cross-site scripting, uh, a whole host of uh, of uh, web application vulnerability type things where you can really learn just on your own and free of charge. Uh, you know, all of the, all these resources are free. Um, a good application to try, uh, if you want to download it, there's a Docker image as well, which makes it even a little bit easier even for setup. Uh, it's called BWAP. Uh, so they have a ton of purposely built-in application vulnerabilities into this application and you're free to hack it all you want and there's plenty of resources to show you how to do that YouTube videos um, and I'll post that in there as well into the chat um, and so uh, yeah so for application security it's pretty easy just to start playing with things and again it, it's it's cheap because it's free you just go download and play and watch YouTube videos on how to break things in applications okay um and uh Kurt, do you have any anything here? I would say I, mean, I echo a lot of what uh, other people say is you know do it by by practicing by by uh, finding your local groups, uh, hacker spaces, uh, maker spaces, as well as uh, the DC area code uh, groups. That's uh, that's for, for DefCon, uh, and uh, maybe go to some of those conferences if if you're curious. I've seen a lot of people uh, go there and, and sort of cut their teeth uh, at conferences by doing capture the flag uh, competitions, which are sort of simulated uh, hacking experiences where you do it competitively. And while uh, at the very top of the uh, CTF uh, game, that is uh, extraordinarily hard to, uh, to excel at, uh, there are a lot of entry level uh, uh, CTF contests that people can, can try and get some experience at it. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, lots of good opportunities out there. You're... Dustin, I think you're talking but muted. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Keith, I saved you to the end for a specific purpose. I know you wanted to talk about the King of the Hill a little bit tonight, so I'm going to leave sure. the mic to you right now. Um, okay, Network King of the Hill is a CTF. It was developed by um, another hacker by the name of Iron Geek. And he, he said, I'm going to paraphrase what he said. <laughs> it was a little more vulgar. He said, it's a, a capture the flag for the lazy administrator. The, um, the idea of building a capture the flag is that you've got vulnerable machines and there's a flag planted on them. And the idea is you... Uh, either use a vulnerability or a chain of vulnerabilities to get a foothold on the machine, read out the flag, which is usually a cryptographic hack, and you apply it to the scoring engine and that gives you points. And the idea is whoever has the most points at the end of the capture the flag wins. If there's a tie, then whoever got to the highest points first wins. That's called a Jeopardy style CTF. They're probably the most common CTF that's kind that uh, um, DEF CON uses. Um, where Network King of the Hill is vastly different. Well, there's one other. There's one called a Attack Defend, and that's where you're given an image that you bring up a virtual machine. You run it. It's vulnerable. The idea is you have to attack others and take down their services while keeping yours running, and you get points for doing all that and have a scoring engine for that. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, CTF time. Canary posted CTF time. Uh, that's in my link of stuff that I posted already to the chat. There's a link to that. Um, we host a Network King of the Hill CTF at every DC404 and 2600 meeting. We even do that virtually. We have a, uh, one of the def DC404 members um, put up a server with a Network King of the Hill capture the flag on it. There are three people who here in Atlanta who are co-developers and one in Nashville. Uh, we all meet at either 2600 or DC404 and run these. It's 
uh, based on standard pen testing vulnerable virtual machines. So we go and get images that are already pre-built for doing pen test training and or challenges. There's You can get ones that people just do for the challenge of it. You can get them off of a site called VulnHub. The link is in the notes I posted. And we bring up these images. The difference between all the other capture the flags and Network King of the Hill is we try to make it as real world as possible. The idea is you have to break into the machine. The scoring engine is looking at some service that serves up content and you have to plant your team flag in that location so that the scoring engine sees it. And for every minute you manage to stay on the machine, you get a point. Unfortunately, everybody else is also trying to hack the same machines and they will come in and kick you out. Uh, and take over the machine. Uh, you're allowed to do anything you want to the machines. There's only two rules for it, or three. You're not supposed to attack the host system that's hosting it, um, which is also running the um, scoring engine. You don't attack the scoring engine. You don't attack the other players. But as far as what you do on the network, you can attack the network. You can attack the, the virtual machines, the targets. And if you want to bring your NSA tools and turn them loose, knock yourself out. There are no rules. You go for it. One little caveat. We have a blue team. We have admins that are running it. And they're going to mess with you. They have multiple saved instances of these machines with different configurations. And they can change them out on a whim right out from under you. So it's exactly like being real world. You've got a, 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 a machine room full of machines. You've got hackers from around the world trying to get a foothold on it and plant your flag. And you're trying not to come to the attention of the local systems administrator who might kick you out. It is a lot of fun. And there's two sides to that. You can either play to get points and play the capture the flag, or you can be one of the blue team guys and actually help defend. So it's just as much fun either way I play both sides of it. It's, it's a lot of fun. The, Key thing to remember, and this is one of the things that is the most daunting for people doing it for the first time, is in your head, we're all Mr. Robot. Uh, Kurt's got Mr. Robot on there. We're all Mr. Robot in our head. But when you're actually looking at a blank screen with a blinking green cursor, and you have no idea what to do next, that's when you actually have to learn to hack, right then. And I don't care if you have zero experience I encourage you to participate in a capture the flag. The exhilaration, the opportunity to try this and be absolutely certain that the FBI will not visit you at your home afterwards is absolutely the best fun you can have. And it's also a great hacking and learning experience. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, and we will be uh, hopefully next year uh, looking at having a uh, room to maybe do some uh, CTF, King of the Hill, uh, Capture the Flag uh, for anybody that may be interested. Um, I'm going to throw the uh, mic, so to speak, to the audience. Uh, does anybody have any questions for our panelists at this point? There was a question earlier about um, the uh, uh, certified ethical hacker. Uh, and so uh, we, we did some text replies, but I figured to go ahead and, and reply on, on voice. Is uh, you know, certified ethical hacker is a particular uh, certification that's provided by a company. Uh, and so to become it, all you have to do is, you know, you pass a test. Of course, it is a red team type, uh, you know, uh, 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 training that takes you through a variety of, uh, uh, you know, different approaches and, um, you know, trying to get you uh, kind of understanding all the different ways that you could, you know, use these different tools and approaches and uh, in, in a red team exercise. Uh, so uh, it is... EC Council, I think is the name of the company. There's, there is, uh, somebody did post the, the link there. Um, it is, uh, it, it is generally looked at as, as a fairly, uh, um, you know, basic uh, certification. But it's, you know, going through and learning all of those different skills will definitely teach you a whole lot. Uh, and so, uh, I wouldn't think of, you know. Uh, you know tens of thousands of dollars into it. There's lots of different ways that you can get training and get certified. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the 
content there is is uh, is, is not too bad. So, uh, one thing I will mention: there is a service called Humble Bundle. If anybody's ever heard of that, which I'm sure some of you have, uh, that commonly does uh, like packages where you might be able to get five or ten books for five or ten bucks. Uh, so it's it, it all goes to a charity. I, it eludes me which one. Uh, but you can get a lot of different uh, IT books. I've seen Certified Ethical Hacker uh, books on there and stuff like that uh, to help you on your journey. Uh, you literally don't have to sit here and pay somebody to teach you something that you could very well teach yourself. And that's what it's all about is learning and making mistakes and fixing those mistakes and then doing it over again. What are the, so, the publishers that comes out with Humble Bundle is uh, uh, No Starch Press. They write uh, or publish a lot of books on computer systems and including a lot of security related books. So uh, look for a, uh, a No Starch Bundle at uh, Humble Bundle and uh, can pick up a lot of really good uh, books for, for uh, pay what you want. Um, all right. So uh, I don't know if everybody in this uh, panel, well, the panelists obviously I know have, but the people attending, uh, if they know what Kali Linux is. So mm -hmm. it, it is, uh, huh? I know, I'm just not in the long. Oh, Kali. okay. All right. Um, so it's basically a suite of tools uh, in, the, in a Debian-based operating system that is, uh, it's basically script kitty type stuff but uh, it can help you on your journey and going through the different exploits, especially using something like Metasploit, and then trying to figure out how to do it manually without Metasploit would be a good exercise to do. I mean, there's all sorts of vulnerabilities you can exploit uh, with various operating systems and be able to, on a Linux system, game root access through FTP, for instance. So, and you can really... Yes, I have a dog named Callie Linux. He's a pug. <laughs> um, oh, would that be snort? But there's, it's just a suite of tools that are very helpful. I would encourage anybody who is interested in it uh, to download uh, VMware Workstation, download some sort of a hypervisor-type system, and install Kali and start playing around with it. Uh, if you don't know much about Linux at this point, I would not recommend putting it on your primary system. Linux is user-friendly to those who know how to use it. So keep that in mind. Um, and just play with it. Figure out what the different tools do. It has wireless hacking. It's got uh, web hacking, all sorts of stuff. So I would really encourage you to do it. You, ha you could even spin up a Docker container and have full-blown Kali inside of a Docker container. So Docker can really be your friend with stuff like this as well, because you can just tear stuff down quickly and rebuild it. Um, so any panelists, do you have anything specific that you would like to talk about? Because we do not have a lot of questions right now, it looks like. I was, I was going to add the uh, – Kali, I think they just uh, ported it over to the new uh, uh, window – or the. Linux subsystem for Windows, uh, so you can actually run it in, in that if you're more familiar with that as a uh, hypervisor. But uh, so Kali and lots of flavors. Yeah, they're actually, I heard, upgrading the Windows subsystem for uh, Linux uh, to WSL2, which is supposed to have a true Linux kernel as opposed to an emulated one. So I think Microsoft is jumping on the Linux bandwagon, and possibly before long, Windows will be based on a Linux kernel, I hope. <laughs> yeah, That'll it's going to, uh, WSL2 will be uh, a level one hypervisor based on um, Hyper-V, the uh, Windows Hyper-V infrastructure. And that has some ups and downs. If, if you turn on any of the hypervisor functionality within Windows, it renders hyper, um, hypervisor two, level two hypervisors dead. So uh, VMware uh, VirtualBox will stop working. <laughs> um, the uh, VMware and VirtualBox are working with Microsoft to try to continue working with those hypervisor function turns on. But for, for now, you just have to turn it off. I would recommend starting with uh, 
you have to learn basic sysadmin skills. The better your sysadmin skills, the better you're going to be at it. And the easiest way to do that without buying lots of hardware is, uh, although you can get a lot of hardware for free, there's plenty and plenty of hardware you can get for free. In fact, come to a DC 404 meeting or one of the other meetings and ask about that. If you go to my um, How to Get Started Hacking page, which I posted earlier, it has a section on where to get hardware. The idea is you install VirtualBox. That's the one I recommend. It's free. And you learn how to install virtual machines. You can start by installing a Kali Linux virtual machine from scratch. You can also experiment with installing uh, other operating systems, Windows. Uh, at a minimum, you have to learn Windows and Linux. So learn to you can get demo versions of Windows 10 and Windows Server that are demos. They're good for either 90 or 120 days. And you can install them in a VM. So you can actually practice installing them. Um, learning how to use a virtual machine is like having a hammer and a saw in your toolbox if you're a carpenter. They're absolutely vital to have some type of virtualization technology, that or Docker or something along those lines. You have to learn something like that because it's a tool you're going to use over and over and over while you're learning to uh, hack and using for hacking. Uh, for instance, quite often, rather than having to try to run WSL2 with Kali in it on my machine. I just spin up a virtual machine with Kali in my box and use Kali. Um, I know a lot of pen testers don't like using the prepackaged uh, distros like Kali or uh, Art, the one based on Arch Linux or Parrot. There's another one called Parrot. They don't like using those. They prefer to roll their own. They actually build out a base operating system and install the exact tools that they like the way they like them. So that's what, that's what happens. But when you first get started, it's better to start with something that's already built, working, so you don't have to struggle with just getting the tools installed just to get to work. Um, so you install a VM of Kali, then you install a VM of a pen test build, and you go to town. Uh, you start learning how to scan the network. You start learning how to do that. In fact, we'll be demonstrating that in Hacking 201. Uh, <coughs> um. I lost my train of thought. Okay, so uh, there, there's just a wealth of stuff out there that you can use uh, for hacking. There's a lot of pieces of software that are open source that you can play with and just try to hack the software. Uh, have a game on Linux that you can't get past the level? Well, go look for the config files, find the level, edit the crap that uh, is blocking you, and then lo and behold... You've just beat that level. So there's a lot of different things you can do with open source software that you can't do with the evil Microsoft software. Um, excuse me. It, who's saying excuse me? Hello. I know C. Stewart had something she wanted to say. She had her hand up earlier. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, You're muted. There you go. I asked it in the, uh, I actually asked it in the um, comments, but um, I was asking about um, Security Plus and CCNA and all that, those certifications. Um, if, if, uh, if y'all would recommend those. They look good to prospective employers, uh, that's for sure. And <laughs> it's, it yes, certainly, could, it certainly couldn't hurt. And it gets you it gets you book experience. It doesn't get you real life experience, but you can get the real life experience by deploying your own Cisco lab for CCNA. I have one not two feet away from me that consists of eight switches and four routers, and I'm uh, off and on working on my CCNP at this point. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, uh, definitely get your certifications. Uh, there is, as far as I'm concerned, they're as good as a diploma. Yeah, one of the things I like about the something like the Security Plus is that uh, uh, it introduces you uh, to a lot of different concepts, and this allows you to figure out is there something that you really, really are interested in, uh, so that you can you know maybe it's vulnerability management, maybe it's you know application security, you know uh, security analysts, uh, you know doing uh, doing blue team stuff, you know you get to start to you know see how all of these different technologies and or 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 disciplines work, um, and that um, you know, especially in larger companies, uh, you know, you get a lot of you know very special specialized uh, places, and so you can go and just just do vulnerability management. 
uh, you go and work for a smaller company, you're going to get, you know, you're going to need to do a bunch of different things. And so most people that start off, you know, find their home in, in larger organizations that can, that can take on uh, that type of person. So, so, you know, as you're going through it, you know, uh, you know, listen to your interests. Not only, you know, finish Sugar Security Plus, it's a great, a great way of kind of demonstrating your, your, uh, your knowledge, but then uh, if you're particularly interested in, that'll help you focus your uh, job search when you're looking for you know, getting into security. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of employees will, employers will pay for certifications. So if you have one that will pay for it, take advantage of it. Because some of these are not cheap. And you have to either be recertified or you have to get continuing education credits to maintain your certification. Um, so if you go down the certification route, it's, it's not a one and done kind of deal. Oh yeah, and if you take a certification test and you fail, you just blew the money on that certification test. You got to pay it all over again to take it again. Yep. So make make sure you're ready before you go to that exam. Uh, CC, I know the CCIE uh, costs thousands of dollars just for the test. You've got to pay for your own hotel, fly out to California, and if you fail the test, well, you're just shit out of a ton of money. <laughs> so uh, make sure you're ready before you do the certification, by all means. Uh, which CCNE track did I go through? Uh, routing and switching. Uh, and that was before they changed at the beginning of this year. So I got it in the end of 2018. Uh, there was a question on the forum. Uh, what do you recommend to gain experience in hacking embedded systems and FPGAs? Uh, I personally have no experience with those, so does anybody have anything they would like to say about that? Uh, yes. Uh, I used to reverse engineer automotive control computers for a living uh, as a contractor. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in fact, my hacking example was a hardware hacking example. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's a, there's a group of us within DC-404 who are into uh, embedded systems hacking, hardware hacking, uh, as well as FPGAs. If you uh, jump on the Discord and talk to Comiger, uh, here, I'll put his handle in here. Um, yeah, if you get on the uh, Atlanta Cybersecurity Engineers Discord and uh, ping Comiger, he will, um, uh, he's into that. And there's quite a few other people that are into it as well. So that's one way to get started is find some other people who are doing that and pick their brains and find out what they're using. Uh, FPGAs are rather interesting device for those who don't know what they do or how they work, but I won't go into the details here. Yeah, that could be a hacking 201 if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> That's my wife, just in case anybody's curious. Um, okay, so, hello, honey. Um, all right. So, let's see, are there any other questions here? Uh, one thing I can add, if you want experience and you want to surround yourself with people, uh, well, when we're not in coronavirus land, if you wish to surround yourself with people who are like-minded, maybe have more experience than you do, find a local hacker space. I know they're mm -hmm. up here in Glen Burnie where I live. Uh, there's a place called Unallocated Space that's probably around five minutes from my house. There's a place down in Atlanta. Keith, what is that one called again? Uh, Freeside Hacker. Atlanta. Freeside, thank you. I've been there yeah, once or I, twice. I posted a link uh, earlier uh, in the chat to a list I have of all the hacker maker spaces in the Atlanta area. Okay. But, I mean, if you're not in the Atlanta area, find one and go from there. Yep. Um, I mean, they're a great community. It's a great place to build camaraderie with people. Uh, they host, well, at least mine, I can't speak for, say, Freeside or other ones. Mine host LAN parties and stuff like that as well, which are fun to go to. Uh, lock picking nights. And uh, we had a lock picking class uh, in hacking 101 a couple of years ago. Was that one of you guys? Xavier, was that you? Uh, no. What, what okay. Uh, I forget who it was, but it was a bit, but it was very interesting how quickly he could pick those things. Yeah, Atlanta Locksport uh, hosts mm -hmm. the mini lockpick village at the DC 404 meetings. Although the virtual meetings, we haven't been doing that very much. 
However, if you want to get on the Discord, you can chat with all the lockpick guys. And there's also a Lockpickers United um, that is a very active international group of lockpicking. Uh, that's also a Discord server. Uh, uh, yeah, you'll have to ping me offline, and I'll see if I can hunt the uh, manager down of that list and get an invite for it. Okay. Um. Well, we're almost done with the hour, so we're at a turning point. Do we wish to go past the hour? Uh, does anybody have anything specific they would like to talk about for Hacking 101? There's a really good cross-reference that the DOD puts out of all the uh, cert cert certifications by area of what you work in, whether you're in a security analyst or a blue team or a red team, and it breaks down. And these are all the certificates that they look at that they want you to have one or more of those in order to work in any of those areas. And I've been searching for this link and I cannot find it. So if I can find it, I can post it to 201 when I get there, if I can find it. Um, I will say this. One interesting piece of software that I've started looking at a little bit. Uh, has anybody ever heard of a piece of software? It's, it's newer. It's called Chasm, K-A-S-M. Uh, no, I haven't heard of that one. Uh, basically what it is, it's a, uh, meth it's a piece of software that is uh, made for security enclaves that uh, you can basically... Uh, what it does is it spins up a Docker container in the background and does, a, I guess, maybe a no VNC connection to that Docker container and makes it where you can access the Internet in places that are locked down so you can't access the Internet from there. So it's a way of, uh, of segmenting the network. And so it has access to it, but the, it doesn't cross security boundaries where information can be transferred between the internal network and the external network necessarily. It sits on the external network. So it's a very interesting piece of software that I've been playing around with a little bit. So if anybody would like to play with it, I'm putting it out there. All right. Uh, Here's a, um, I found, by the way, I'm building a uh, network training lab. I highly recommend you build your own training lab if you don't have yep. one. And if you want to know how to do that, we actually have free classes. So. I found um, uh, the uh, one of the recent projects I did is is to, to build a pie hole. Uh, this was uh, it's inspired off of the one of the blue team village uh, at, at DefCon. Uh, just kind of an intro on how you know putting that together. I'm like, why haven't I done this yet? So, thirty five dollars gets you a uh, you know a Raspberry Pi three. Uh, pie hole is software that runs on top of that. Uh, it basically is a DNS server, and the goal is a kind of a black hole. That's where the hole comes from, pie hole, um, and uh, protects you from things like uh, advertising, uh, you know, trackers. Uh, it's it interesting to see how much my Roku was sending back to uh, the mothership about all the stuff that my kids watch. Uh, and so uh, you can block all of that by, uh, you know, $35. And, uh, for the for the Raspberry Pi uh, memory card, uh, it takes a couple of minutes to you know download the OS and uh, and there's some, uh, some pretty good uh, instructions on how to get that set up. So uh, you know as part of you know setting up lab, uh, that's another little side project uh, if you want to set up your own DNS server. It doesn't have to be on a Raspberry Pi. You can also run the the Pi Hole software on pretty much any uh, uh, Linux out there. So uh, if you've got your own servers, you can do it there as well. Um, uh, one, one good resource, uh, Keith posted the uh, certificationkits.com. That's good for if you want to get a full working lab uh, right off the rip. But if you part it out and uh, buy a switch from uh, Craigslist here and a router from LetGo here and stuff like that, you can usually get the uh, parts you need for a lab relatively cheap. Uh, anybody who wants to get serious about virtualization and stuff like that, find yourself a basic server. Load up a piece of soft, uh, hypervisor called ESXi. Uh, it's basically an operating system that sits on top of it, and all it's made to do is run virtual machines. And learn how to use that, and then you can uh, make your own home infrastructure. I mean, I've got an ESXi server here, 96 gigs of RAM. I run an Active Directory, Exchange, uh, a Docker server, all sorts of stuff on it. 
and it cost me what 600 bucks when I first got it so I mean they're not expensive and it would be a good way to get started because then you could uh, go in and have the resources to deploy darn near anything you'd want to deploy in order to play around with labs uh, you've got uh, G, uh, what is it uh, GNS3 for Cisco certification labs if you wanted to go virtual instead of using the real hardware I would recommend using the real hardware but if you can't afford that GNS3 is absolutely free and it does have some limitations but you can get through your CCNA with that um, you'll need to get uh, images for the routers and stuff like that it does not provide that um, and uh, there's also you can go to uh, recycling centers uh, there's one in Atlanta called eRecycle USA that I used to commonly go to to get routers switches servers stuff like that people are throwing them out recycling they shredded the hard drives and they're selling the system for rock bottom prices otherwise it's just going to turn into scrap metal so that's a good th that's a good way to go about it as well I posted the DoD approved uh, baseline certificates link I found it and with the help of canary help me find that. And uh, on, on the pie hole, if you're interested in running a pie hole, I've been running one for a couple of years. And if you turn on logging, it's going to eat your SD card. <laughs> um, okay, so if you get one of the new Raspberry Pi 3s, uh, the latest model of a Raspberry Pi 3 or Raspberry Pi 4, either one, both of those can be um, modified uh, easily. Uh, in fact, it's part of their configuration to make them boot without an SD card boot directly from a hard drive. And so what I did is I simply got an old IDE hard drive external USB that I used to have laying around. It was scrap. It was like 10 gigs, which for a Raspberry Pi is plenty. Um, and I put this IDE hard drive in this case, USB plugged into the Raspberry Pi, and installed everything to the hard drive and told it to boot from the hard drive. No more messed up SD cards. <laughs> What's great about that is, is I'm sure that your hard drive was bigger than the Raspberry Pi. Oh yeah, right? it actually makes it a great stand mm -hmm. to put the Raspberry Pi on top of. <laughs> Keeps it warm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, oh, with the Raspberry Pi, you can also do something called RetroPie, where you can look, it's basically an emulation station uh, system that you can load old Sega Genesis and Nintendo and Super Nintendo games onto it. Uh, and you don't have to worry about these uh, ones out there that you're you're bound to just Nintendo or Super Nintendo or whatever these uh, systems they sell at GameStop and stuff like that. You can run whatever you want on it. And I've had some success up to Nintendo 64. And then after that, the GPU uh, requirement is just too great for it. Uh, also, if you want to get all the, the actual joysticks and the buttons and all that stuff, including all the way up to the game cabinet that you can put everything in, they have it at Micro Center. Oh, they have a game cabinet for it now at Micro Center? A desktop cabinet, a full standing cabinet, and all the different buttons, controllers, everything for building out a game cabinet uh, with a retro pie. Uh, and you prob if you're going to get a uh, if you're going to get a Pi, you probably want to learn Python because anything anything you do on it is usually going to require it. And don't waste your time with Python two. Go with Python three. Yeah. And uh, now I, I realize there's people here that might not be in Atlanta, and we've been posting a lot of heavy Atlanta stuff. Uh, yeah. So what I would recommend you do is if you are in another area and you you I mean you have no idea where to start. Join one of the other groups here in Atlanta. Tell them that you want to start a group or you need help finding a group. We'll help you. Well, um, we've helped several other DEF CON groups get started with a CTF. They heard that we were doing a CTF. They wanted to know how to do it. We did a virtual training classes and got them all set up and got the virtual machine set up, got everything done. So we're more than happy to help you um, learn how to do this and get something started in your area. Uh, I've there's a group called DEFCON Groups. Uh, there's groups literally all over the world. So there may be a group in your area. Same with the 2600. And if there isn't one, you can start one. We'll even help you get over the hump of what you got to do to start a group and get it running. Um, so what do you guys think about the fact that, uh, what was it, IBM uh, acquired Red Hat? you guys have an opinion on that at all? 
Well, I, I used to work for IBM, so I got interesting uh, opinion. The um, a lot of Red Hat, when you call up Red Hat for support, was an IBMer. So it would like it was one of those where it, it, it made a whole lot of sense from uh, um, from that perspective is that the, that the, you know there was already a good chunk of uh, quote unquote Red Hat that was already outsourced to IBM and so it was uh, it, it, it really is a uh, wasn't too big of a you know, culture shift for those that moved over some you know there always is some bumps and those type of acquisitions but uh, in the end I think it made made a lot of sense. Yeah, I was just more worried about them uh, doing something to screw up the CentOS project. So, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, uh, I think that we can. Uh, I had one thing to add. Uh, I'm Please. typing this in there too. If, by the way, if you'd like to save everything that's been posted in the chat, this will save me having to type this. Um, if you look at the top where it says public chat at the top of the window, to the right are three little dots. You can click that and either copy or save, and it will save um, the contents of the entire chat window. So you can save all the links and all the comments and everything else. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to add? OK. Well, I'm going to let uh, all of our panelists get on with their evenings here. I uh, don't know if they have any more panels to go to or if they're just going to be relaxing. but. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out uh, 2020 Hacking 101. And tomorrow night at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time is going to be Hacking 201. Uh, we will go into more depth. And it is usually a little more of a free-for-all where we can uh, talk about pretty much anything we want. So uh, tomorrow we might have Johnny X returning as a panelist. So. I'm hoping he's he's working on uh, he's in college right now, so he's working on calculus and some other things. Uh, he told me today about uh, he had a his first project with Java was simply to write a Hello World application. <laughs> <laughs> How did so, he do? Um, I assume good. Knowing him, he'd say, what, lang what language would you like that hello world to be in? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or he'd write a quine, and it would be a program that actually writes the program that puts out hello world. So oh, That would be good. Uh, I, and my response to him was, why are they teaching you Java? I mean, go to Python, go to C, go to something meaningful. Java is dying. Java is slow. Java should die. A very slow, painful death, which I think it already is. But uh, anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and close everything out for the night. And I will see all of you in Hacking 201. And uh, invite your friends. Uh, if you know somebody who's into this type of stuff, have them there tomorrow. Uh, we would love to have them uh, involved. Thank you very much for your time. And have a good night. <laughs>